Welcome to chapter number two. As you can see from the chapter naming, this is going to talk about organizational strategies and project selection. A big part of this has to do with the fact that you would like goal congruence. Here's again the map, and we're now in chapter two, obviously, with dealing with strategies. The objectives that we have, and as I mentioned for chapter number one, I'm not going to read through all of these. That is really rather um, unnecessary at our level of education. But we're going to talk a bit about uh, why project managers need to understand the organization strategy and how that affects the project. That they need to be in sync. How projects number two, how the projects um, affect and support so if you hire a school and you're worried about retention, you need to do things to and set up projects so that students will continue to stay in school and they don't drop out or transfer to another school. And it's very important to understand not only the say that students who stay at your school, but you understand your lost customers. Why did they leave? Why did they stop coming? Why did they drop out? What was not working well for them? So schools not only just need and Businesses not only need to know about the customers that they do have, but they need to pay attention to why people won't go there. A lot of that in education is related to, to um, prestige or history, in, uh, reputation, things along that line, and why people left. So we're going to also talk about the phase gateway model. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, financial and non-financial criteria. Not everything is dollars. It's, it pains me to say that. But there are factors that we, there are in the projects that we do that are purely cost, especially for, say, environmental. Uh, and we as a society say that that is of value, that it's not just about the revenue side or cost benefit. Uh, the benefits can be soft as opposed to, like, for people's health although you can't quantify that. So here's uh, the outline of the various sections, and we'll go through them. We need to understand what the organization is trying to do and how this project is trying to perhaps either support the organization in its current uh, format, support their, their direction, or perhaps move the organization in a, in a different way. One of the best examples that comes to mind is Apple. Apple was purely a computer company in the sense of laptops and desktops and things along that line. And then probably about 15 years ago now, I think it was 2007 actually, uh, or maybe even a little earlier than that, all of a sudden Apple is, they have a phone. As you're all well aware, called the iPhone. That was developed in a project. And that then led to things like tablets, et cetera, and, you know, the iPad. And so Apple is now very dominated, especially by iPhones. 55% of Apple's profit is iPhone. They could eliminate all their other products. And things like the iWatch, which was also a project, Ah, it has no effect really on their bottom line. Just like, you know, Microsoft adding to Microsoft Office. Now they have, and for many years, they've had the Xbox, et cetera. So you have those, um, it took the company in a different direction. Uh, Apple is very much an iPhone company now. So it's it's competes obviously with Samsung and LG, et cetera, Huawei. So you need to be uh, aware of that. Is it trying to support the current organization or move it in a new direction? And even within various schools, there is, especially with what the pandemic has, has created, there is a movement amongst some of the management at the various schools to modify, they view this as an opportunity to modify the traditional way that we do schooling in post-secondary. 
I felt that the way we personally speaking, just my own uh, view on it, the way that we personally deal uh, with post-secondary is a very flawed and very expensive model. Yes, there is great value in meeting, but we spend a lot of time doing the same thing over and over and over again, which is not necessary. Like these pre-recorded videos, we could have done those years ago, but with the now having to do them, um, they, they can save a lot of time. We don't need three hours or four hours a week in the classroom. And so we can give you not uh, YouTube University, but we can give you Netflix, which is on demand. And so you don't have to do the same thing over and over and over again. And like me presenting these over and over and over again for years and years. Just update them, keep them current, and students can view them at their leisure. But you still need an, a, a live lecture uh, component. The point that I'm trying to make with that, so let me be succinct with it, is your trying, management and senior management are, cons are considering in some cases changing the way that it's done. Now, there's still, there will always be the face-to-face. All right, don't panic about that if you're one of those people who just love face-to-face. -face. But there's also now a recognition that we can deliver a lot, if not in some cases better services, by using and leveraging uh, technology. Just think about the, the services you get from uh, corporations and how you've got uh, people to answer your questions 24 hours a day if you go online and support. And so... It, it's just a new way of doing things. I think that you've all taken a strategic management course. So it's just, uh, I'll mention this very briefly. As you can see, it's the process, process of ass assessing what we are. And do we intend to be the, continue to do the be the same? Or do we want to be slightly different? So you, I'm not going to go through st strategies and visions and missions and all of that. So the strategic management process, again, reviewing and defining the organizational mission. This is what we want to become. You need to evolve. Steve Bezos, or Bezos, um, the person who runs uh, Amazon, he said that one day some company will come along and replace Amazon. And I find it really rather interesting because I'm old enough to remember where Amazon was is a couple of months away from being bankrupt. So was Apple, by the way. And Amazon was books. They simply sold books. They couldn't make enough money doing that. And now Amazon, as I like to say, and it's, if you've got their packages, which I'm sure most, if not all of you have, anything, it's a marketplace for anything from A to Z. So... They became, they were not the same. Netflix used to be mailing in uh, videos rather than going to your Blockbuster store. If any of you are old enough to remember Blockbuster, look it up if you're not. And so Netflix became and moved from uh, the mailing in and returning uh, videotapes to what you know. It's on demand, it's online, and you couldn't do that 20 years ago. We didn't have the technology. We didn't have the infrastructure to be able to do that. So they, they redefine themselves. And some, some company, so Netflix replaced Blockbuster. And at some point, with uh, things like 5G coming up, you may not even need Netflix, or your Netflix will just go to your phones or your tablets. You have a 5G tablet, and you watch your movies on your tablet, and movies will download in a couple of minutes for a high-def movie with 5G. Anyways, you need to redefine yourselves. If you just keep doing the same thing, you become like Eaton's, if some of you remember that. Analyze the strategies, set objectives, implement strategies through your projects. So here's sort of a nice flow chart of what we just talked about. You need to be smart. I would imagine almost all of you have seen this before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Be specific, measurable. In other words, 
give me some numbers. Don't just say, oh, we're going to run a fundraising event and we want to make money. Mm, no, 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 no. We're going to run a fundraising event to raise money for this organization and we want to raise a pro or have a profit of at least $7,000. I don't care what the number is. I'm not going to judge you and say, oh, no, it should be eleven. No, no, no. Just give me something. Put some numbers. That would be the first thing I look at in your when you were telling me what your project's about. Do you have any numbers? Even if it's something we want to boost morale. Well, find out what the morale currently is. You could do surveys on morale and then run your event and then run sur surveys and see whether they've actually it's move, improved morale. It can be done, people. So make sure that uh, you know that, and we'll talk about this with our responsibility matrix, that the objectives are assignable to one person. You need one person who knows that they're in charge of that particular area with, of course, help from others. It needs to be realistic. You know, it's not like I say, hey, class, let's plan a trip to Mars. And we have to have off and flying there by the end of the term. Like, are you kidding me? This takes uh, way more. It's not, it's not realistic. And then, of course, have some time. So you need to be careful about the time, the cost, and the scope, and following SMART. Implementation gap, uh, where you're, you're, there's something lacking, and you need, and, and in this case, it can be even a strategy between the top and the middle managers. There's a gap. There's something missing. It's a need. You need, have to also deal with organizational politics, which unfortunately is necessary. Uh, and uh, you can also sometimes have a uh, high-level person who is promoting a certain uh, project. It's like their pet project. And so because of their position, they get the project approved. This happens all the time. So, you know, just like if you start at a new company and you're just starting, it may be, you may find that it's very difficult to get some of your thoughts and ideas into, into place until you become uh, a little more seasoned, a little more experienced, and people start looking, at, you know, and just say, well, you started last week. You don't know anything yet. Okay, fine. And organizations that really know what they're doing, by the way, the new people they hire who, quote, don't know what they're doing, come up with the absolutely some of the very best ideas on ways to change the, the, the way the company operates. Because, and I'll say you can use this at an interview. Somebody says, why should we hire you? You have no experience. And you could say, that's exactly why you should hire me. Because I'm going to come in with, with an open mind and a fresh way of thinking. And you're not going to hear me say, that's the way we've always done it. And I could give you specific examples of many of my students who've gone out into industry and in some cases saved the companies $15,000 a month with the simple suggestion of changing the way that they hauled away the scrap lumber. $15,000 a month they were wasting because that's the way we've always done it. They just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Just think about what the, the pandemic has done to your life and how you've, oh, maybe you ordered something online and it's free delivery and it's here in a, a day or two or maybe later that day as you used to have to oh, get dressed, go to your cold car or get on the train, go and get it. You just have it delivered to your door. So problem number three. Again, conflicts over resources, financial, materials, people. Now, some of the, th the advantages is you build uh, some discipline into your selection process. You, you have a reason. <laughs> you build metrics. One of the organizations I present in supply chain is Alaska Airlines, and they have a phrase, if it's not being measured, it's not being managed. And large companies, again, like Amazon, which I have four former students working at. Yeah, Amazon. Amazon uh, has lots of metrics. They measure 
lots of things with their scanners and their devices and things along that line. So point number three, uh, I call this uh, management by fact, not opinion. So you have criteria rather than just like, well, I'm the boss. That's the way it is. That doesn't go over very well. I've been the boss. I've been the CEO. And just like, in essence, bossing people around doesn't go in today's world. I don't care what area you work with. And, and the, the schools that I teach at, in no way, shape, or form does my boss boss me around. I respect them. I know they're my boss. But they also respect my judgment and my professionalism and the way that I do things. And they just say, here's what we want done. You figure out how to get there. And I guess if there's a lot of student complaints, then they know about it. But as long as I'm, quote, doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I, quote, won't get in trouble. Allocating resources, balancing risk, etc., cetera. Uh, and improving communications. One of the parts of your project report will be a communication plan. So some of the classifications, things that you must do, like because it's law or regulation, uh, some for that are strategic and some that are operational. More like operational would be updating your software system. The phase gate model uh, needs to go through a series of phases or gates. And you need to make sure that each time you're checking to make sure, is this worthwhile? Because not all projects come to fruition. I forget the exact number, 80 plus percent of ideas for, for like new products and stuff never actually get to market. So you need to keep checking. So you can also go ahead with the project, kill slash cancel the project or revise it, which is very common. It gets various iterations. You get feedback from customers. Say, I like this. I don't like that. And organizations uh, that pay attention to that will succeed the, with their customers. So here's just, again, a graphic on it. So let you just take a look at that. That's fairly straightforward. Make the proposal, screen it, et cetera. And at any point, you can go back. Some of the criteria are payback period, uh, net present value, if anybody is been taking finance, you know what these are. You also have non-financial criteria just because, well, it's good for the environment. It's good for our public relations or image. Payback model um, simply says, you students tend to be young, early 20s. Why are you going to university? Because you're going to get your degree and then you're going to leverage that degree to make more money to do jobs that you want, that you need that parchment and make more money for yourselves. People who are older don't do that because we don't have enough time to get our money back. And for those of us who are teaching, we did that. When we were your age, we went to university. And now, depending on the age, it's not worth it. And depending on, and you will get to the same point yourself. When you're 20, getting a university degree is a great idea. When you're 60, unless there's, for financial reasons, it's not a good idea. You should be raking in the, the big paychecks. It's very simple. It tells you time. And so you went to university, you spent $40,000. You make an extra $8,000 a year because you have a degree. It takes you five years to get your money back. Uh, it d doesn't in include time value of money. And after the f you get your money back, it stops factoring in. You just didn't go to university, spend 40 grand and spend five or six of your years of your life to get your four-year degree. And by the way, the average is six years now. And to, to get your money back five, eight, ten years later, no, that's you want more than that. You want a return on your investment. So here's just a spreadsheet, and you're welcome to use this in your project. And you can just come up and estimate. I don't have, and I'm not going to critique that about the 700,000 and the 400,000 and the annual savings. You can kind of make it up to tell you the truth. The point that I, because you'll get that from your accounting, you'll get that from your accounting uh, people. 
They'll come up with the numbers. But the fact that you know that you've calculated a payback period. Net present value does incorporate uh, the time value of money. You know that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in the future. And here's again a spreadsheet. So just keep it simple, people. I want you to demonstrate to me in your project that you understand there's a payback period. You understand there's a there's a that you should look at net present value. When you work in industry, there'll be people who do this. This will be your finance slash accounting people actually do the numbers. But you need to know what the heck they are. What does it mean? So in this particular case, based on uh, based on the net present value. So what that means is you calculate all the money and you put it in today's dollars. So a positive net present value, as you can see at the bottom, except that means you'll be $54,235 richer than you would have been otherwise. But I want to make it clear, it's not a profit. You require a 15% rate of return or more. At 15% exactly, the net present value is zero. So what it means is you earn 15% plus an additional 54235 In Project B, you didn't lose money. You just didn't make enough. You said, I want to earn at least 15%. And you made $31,263 below 31%, or sorry, 15%. So to put it in a student's perspective, let's say you set yourself as a target of a grade point average of a three, and you wind up with 3.2. Your net present value on grade point would be 0.2 positive. Let's say that you have a rough term and you get a 2.7. You don't get a negative grade point average, but your net present value is negative 0.3. So it's the difference between your target and your actual. So it doesn't mean you lost or made money. So you set yourself a target and it measures, did you meet my target or above, which is acceptable? Or if I'm below the target, it's unacceptable. Same as if you set a criteria, I'm gonna graduate and I wanna get a job that pays at least 40,000 a year. You get a job offer that offers you 45, it's $4,000 above your target, it's good. But if it offers you 38, it's negative 2,000 as your net present value. It's below your target. So some non-financial non uh, criteria, sometimes companies will just go into places to uh, capture market share. As far as I'm aware, things like the Xbox have never really actually turned a profit or they make their money in other ways. The, the base units, they don't make any money on. They make money off the games, et cetera, or just to get them their product into the, the home environment. Uh, same as things like the uh, uh, Google products, uh, the Amazon Alexa, uh, things along that line. And I believe Facebook now also has uh, voice technology at home. And just to get, just get it into the home. They'll even lose money. So uh, they also make it difficult for uh, competitors to enter market. You have to be careful. This may violate certain laws, <laughs> all right, when you deliberately keep competitors out. Depending on the industry, you all take in economics. You all understand about perfect competition and oligopolies and things along that line. And monopolies, which is sometimes uh, where there is no competition. Go through your checklists, your weighted scoring. So checklist is very simple. Everything is created equal and multi-scoring is exactly what we'll see in a moment. Here's some examples of some questions that you have. Uh, does this support the organization and is it aligned? Uh, does it solve the business problem? Who's sponsoring it? What's the risk of doing it? What's the risk of not doing it? On and on. There's all kinds of criteria. Here's a, uh, a weighted model where you have, you take the weight and you multiply it by the score. Usually the scores, as you can see in this case, uh, in the, the matrix portion are scored from 0 to 10. And 
a lot of thought and effort is put into the various weights that will usually add up to be, well, in this case, uh, it will total up to be a hundred percent. And so you, what you do is you take the weight. So on project one, you take the 2.0 multiplied by one, then add it to 3.0 multiplied by 24, or t sorry, eight to get 24. So you take the row at the top where it says the weight and you multiply it by the row of the project and you sum it up. And what it does is it gives you a numerical score. Uh, so you can see just very quickly, project five, it's, it's not the best in everything, but overall it's, the best the score is 102 well above any of the others but you still have to factor in some non uh, numeric or t f you know you may just not be allowed to do it you can also see the project two is not very good and you can see some sort of rankings here by the way you can even use this for your own personal lines let's say you're considering uh, multiple job offers or or even one and what you want to do with your life or or let's say you're looking at living somewhere and your various locations have very rarely when will one place be the best the best the best the best you can use it for make, make a decision to buy a car or a house or whatever so you can have a place uh, to live that's you can walk to work how important is that but the job pays five thousand dollars a year less than when you've got to drive across the city for and as the, you know, all these kind of criteria, if you have a significant other or if you have children or things along that line, all of these can come into play. Now, you need to select uh, a model that fits organizational strategies. And again, it's not my intent to read the PowerPoint slides. I'm just going to uh, identify it, see the weighting, pick the criteria, uh, scoring criteria that is the best and then you can see there was a couple of them on the last slide that right away we can basically filter out and then try and focus in on the higher end ones especially if we get a few projects at the top that are very similar scores we had one that 102 was way above everything else so it would be the front runner you can request proposals from outside sources to get an idea of uh, the timelines and the costs your organization may not have a real good idea, so you may want to do this and see what kind of um, bidding you get. And uh, and then again, ranking them uh, in terms of feasibility, do they fit the organization strategy? Uh, are we going to accept or reject uh, the problem? Here's again, uh, a project proposal form. This is just something you can actually use in your project. So that, to answer these questions, you can use this form and you can see all of the questions. You can delete some of them. You can add some of them. You can modify them, whatever, whatever works well for you. And again, a risk assessment, which we'll go through uh, in an upcoming chapter where we'll do a much more extensive risk assessment. But if you want to do, um, just use this form again to to do a brief risk assessment that's fine my goal is not to have you create a report that is hundreds of pages long just show me that you understand that that you need to identify risks and how to assess it and i'm good with that so i'm not looking for pages upon pages of the same thing show me that you know how to know how to do it once and then move on to the next thing so again here's a screening process and you can see quite often you can reject, reject, and if it meets all of the criteria, you can accept it and invest in the project. Here's uh, another additional model where you're talking about uh, the importance and the scoring. And again, this is just a sample. You need to get ma senior management input because if they don't support it, you're probably not going to be able to get the resources that you need. Although some co corporations pride themselves in what some organizations call skunk works. What that means is they're, they're not banned, but they're not formally authorized. One of the most famous situations of this is, as an example, 3M. 
Many years ago, 3M was trying to develop a very strong adhesive. And what they came up with was a very weak adhesive. And they spent a lot of money trying to develop this adhesive. And they couldn't figure out what to do with it. It was, the, in fact, if you want to say kind of the opposite. Well, one day, one of their um, people who, who I don't even think was working on the project decided and found that they could use it as the product that we now call sticky notes. I'm sure all of you have used sticky notes. And that was originally a 3M product. Well, people didn't used to have those. And that really strong adhesive turned into the really weak adhesive, strong enough to keep the sticky note sticking <laughs> in most cases. And yet when you pull it off, it doesn't leave a, like a residual or very little residual on the where whatever it was attached to. And so they actually took these and sent them out to organizations as free as promos. And people said, we want this. We want to buy it. And now that is commonplace, I'm sure. Probably some of you might even have a sticky note within arm's reach of where you currently are. That was an accident. And, but it's still, and it wasn't an authorized. Like in this case, in some ways it was the, to develop the strong adhesive. But they came up with something totally different. Rather than just abandoning it, they found a different alternative for it. All right. Here's a portfolio uh, of risks and types of projects. This is uh, from David and Jim Matheson, who studied R&D and organizations. You have bread and butter who needs to make like evolutionary. This is, uh, Toyota does this. Uh, they call it Kaizen, which is an evolutionary approach. Uh, Pearls, which are revolutionary, like something very different. Um, Nissan has gone to an approach where they don't use Kaizen like Toyota does. They use something called Kakushin. And what they go back to the square one or ground zero. And they said, uh, for painting a car, they paint the engine block. Well, rather than just trying to find a bit better way to do it and improve it by one or two or three percent, then what Nissan did was, let's start all over again. They saved 90% of the paint. They used one-tenth of the amount of paint. That is a pearl. And sometimes, and I would say that in post-secondary, and I no one school is talking about doing this, rather than having like all the same material, say introduction to accounting, debits and credits and liabilities and all that basic stuff that you took. Why does it have to be redone over and over and over again every term? And people have to go to a classroom and read notes and write down, you know, assets equals liabilities plus equity. Really? There's lots of really good videos from the publishers on that. If an instructor wants to create their own or there's one for the school and everybody shares it, we don't have to have three hours of class. We can have an hour and a half to two hours and have what we're going to do with this class, these lectures are outside of class time. But we're going to talk about them in class because we expect you to listen to these. And oysters involve technological breakthroughs, things that we couldn't do before. If we didn't have, I've been teaching online for literally 20 years. And this is now, when I'm recording this, this is 2020. Well, we have much more technology than we had back then and the things that we can do uh, with video and audio and t drawing tablets and things along this line. That is because of advances in technology. And the big revolution coming up as we're speaking is 5G. Much like much, much faster than uh, 4G and white elephants. It looked good at the time, but it's not at this point. So they're bad ideas or become outdated. Here's some of the uh, key terms, as you can see. We've pretty much talked about all of them. And that's the end of chapter number two. Thank you for listening.